Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the RGS. It's really wonderful to see such a packed house tonight. My name's Lizzie Carey Thomas, and I'm head of programs at the Serpentine Galleries. And it is my pleasure now to introduce you to Jana Peel, CEO of the Serpentine Galleries. A very warm welcome to you all for an evening with Christo from all of us at the Serpentine Galleries. It is our mission to inspire the widest audiences with the wildest possibilities of art and architecture, and audiences certainly don't come much bigger than the millions who visit us in Hyde Park each summer. Now, big audiences demand big ideas, and Christo has certainly delivered in size, scale, and excellence for his first public sculpture in the UK. We hope you have all witnessed the awe-inspiring sight of the London Mastaba rising majestically above the Serpentine Lake. At 20 meters high, 40 meters wide, and made up of 7,500 barrels, it is truly unmissable, attracting record reviews and record crowds. A month ago, we had the great pride and privilege of also opening an exhibition at the Serpentine that truly pays testament to that towering ambition. It spans six decades of Christo's celebrated commissions with his late wife, Jean-Claude, where every project started with the question, wouldn't it be beautiful if? As we near the Serpentine's own 50-year milestone in 2020, we take huge inspiration from such a remarkable lifetime of partnership and collaboration. As Christo says, the story of each project is unique. Our projects have no precedent. The same might be said of our ambitions for every show at the Serpentine Galleries. Now, Christo and Jean-Claude's exhibition is the highlight of a summer where artists have shed both heat and light at both of our galleries. At the Serpentine, we've had the stunning 2018 Pavilion by Frida Escobedo, and at the Sackler Gallery, the 25 beguiling paintings of Turner Prize winner Toma Outs. What a season of inspiration and reflection of exciting encounters and creative contrasts. Frida Escobedo is 38, Christo is 83, but as you'll see this evening, for him, age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. What does matter is the tremendous generosity and philanthropy that have gone into creating this incredible uh, commission for Christo. Hans Ulrich, the artistic director of the galleries, and I like to say there are two kinds of people, those who do support the Serpentine and those who will. Now, there are, on that note, many people to thank for the realization of Christo and Jean-Claude's exhibition, and the London Mostaba is truly the moment uh, to acknowledge them ahead of tonight's discussion. Of course, first and foremost, we thank Christo for his dedication, enthusiasm, and tireless vision. We are so thrilled that he accepted our invitation to give tonight's talk. Can you please give me a round of applause for Christo? Of course, our visionary chairman, Michael Bloomberg, and his team were champions of Christo's acclaimed 2005 installation, The Gates in Central Park, and our friends from Bloomberg Philanthropies are well represented tonight. Alongside Michael Bloomberg's colleagues, Patty Harris, CEO of Bloomberg Philanthropies, and Gemma Reed, the team has truly been instrumental in making the summer of Christo in London possible. We are all here today because we believe in the power of arts to transform people, places, and even whole cities. Futures cannot be predicted, but they can be invented. And Christo teaches us that the future for the arts is quite simply for everyone. Thank you so much. Please join me in a round of applause for Hans Ulrich Obrist, Artistic Director of the Serpentine Galleries, who joins us on the stage right now. Yana, yeah, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, friends and fellow travelers. Thank you all for being here. It's a very special moment. Uh, Christo will give a lecture tonight. And uh, as Yana said, it's our dream come true that this project uh, with Christo could happen here in London. Uh, we invited uh, Christo for the first time to the Miracle Marathon 
two years ago. The marathon is our annual knowledge festival where we bring together all disciplines around the theme. And we, the theme was miracle. And we, of course, had experienced Christo's amazing uh, miracle of the lake in Italy, the walking on water. So we invited him to talk about it and to discuss, actually, possibilities of doing a project for the first time in London. And the miracle did happen because we walked together in the park. And all of a sudden, when we were on the bridge, Christo halted and pointed to the Serpentine Lake and started to tell us about the amazing Mastaba idea, which uh, was the idea of a floating Mastaba he had first developed in the 1960s for Lake Michigan, and which remained an unrealized project. And we always feel at the Serpentine that it's our role to make unrealized projects of artists a reality. So we are so delighted that this could happen here. The Mastaba, of course, is the oldest dramatic form created from the first urban civilization as Christo often says, we wrongly you know, attribute it often to Egypt. It goes further back to Mesopotamia, more than 8,000 years, and is connected to architecture there, which, of course, is the background, because everything with Christo started with architecture. And when he then, together with Jean-Claude, ever since the early 60s, started to develop these amazing public projects, he more and more went into public space. And here is a quote. Christo told us, art is incredibly enjoyable. Fortunately, what I'm doing is not a traditional studio practice. It's very rich, and probably this is the secret why we see so many people outside of the art world. We are deeply involved with society, real society and community, not an illustration of society. It's very enchanting. And it's really this engagement with society which we're celebrating tonight. Please give another big applause for Christo. And of course, as Chris said from the beginning, this is not only a sculpture, it has also a lot to do with painting. Uh, we encourage you all to experience the Mastaba at many different moments of the day because it keeps changing uh, in the light, in the reflection. It really is like an abstract painting, and all of a sudden, it actually can turn gold. It's a, it's a true miracle. We are deeply grateful, as Jana said, to the many, many people who made this project possible, foremost, of course, to, uh, to Christo for the incredible engagement, the incredible dialogue, the incredible friendship over the last uh, two years. We are also deeply grateful uh, to Mike Bloomberg, to Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, of course, also the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, deeply grateful to, to Westminster, deeply grateful to the Royal Parks, and to everyone who really made it possible that this project could happen in London. The Terra Foundation for American Art, the Henry Moore Foundation, as well as also the Arts Council of England, Aircomweil, uh, and of course, Christos' amazing team. Uh, Erin Bazos, Adam Blackburn, Jennifer Crook, Lorenza Giovanelli, Jonathan Henry, Josie Kraft, Matthias Kodenberg, Megan Schiki, Jerome Seman, Wolfgang Waltz, and last but not least, Vladimir Yavachev. Please give him a big round of applause. We are also deeply grateful to Dr. Simone Filippi, uh, of course, from the Taschen Publishing House, to Benedict Taschen, as well as to the authors of the book, Paul Goldberger and Adam Blackburn, as well as the photographer, Wolfgang Waltz. And then, of course, our all gratitude, Jana's and mine, and the Serpentine goes to the Serpentine Dream Team, to Lizzie Carey Thomas, Head of Programs, to Julie Burnell, Head of Construction and Buildings, to Rose Dempsey, Head of Communications, to Melissa Blanchflower, who is the curator of the exhibition Jana mentioned, which we hope you can all visit, uh, the exhibition of Christo and Jean-Claude at the Serpentine, to Mike Gaughan, the gallery manager, and to Joel Bunn, the installation and production manager, as well as the live program dream team, Claude Agil, Costas Stasinopoulos, Tamar Clark-Brown, Katarina Abateno, Holly Shuttleworth, and Kamal Akri. Please give them a very big round of applause. And we are, as always, grateful to the Royal Geographical Society for the ongoing wonderful collaboration. And now, please give a very, very warm welcome to the amazing one and only Christo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you know, I am a very poor speaker. And what I do now, I will show you some images for the project we did for over 50 years, very fast, like a telegraphic style.
to see the images because we talk about things that probably you don't remember, we never saw. And after that, I will put all the lights. We have a little conversation with Hans Ulrich. But after that, you should ask questions. And I will answer questions and try to be articulate and properly answer. But please be courageous to ask questions. Now we can start very fast. Uh, you know, in 1969, uh, we did a project Rap Coast in Australia. Outside of Sydney, we're up coastline with a very high cliff to sandy beaches. In 1972, we finished Valley Curtain in Colorado, a huge curtain on the side of Brooklyn Bridge and the western slope, 100 and, uh, uh, 180 meters in the center, 360 meters in the foundation. In 1976, we finished the running fence in Northern California. This tall fence, five, six meters high, running for 40 kilometers in Sonoma Marine County and western extremity of the fence disappearing Pacific Ocean. In 1978, we did very intimate project in Kansas City in the loose park. We cover the work with this golden fabric. In 1983, we realized that surrounded island. This is not a good light. Why is something out? Who kill all the lights? All the lights out. I don't need to, I don't read. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we did surrounded island. We surrounded 11 islands with six and a half. 650 square meter fabric floating in the surface of the water. You have that uh, boom at the end of the boom in the sandy beaches. In 1985, we finished the pond of the oldest bridge in Arab, uh, Paris. We wrapped the champagne color fabric uh, for two weeks. We have over 3 million people walking. It was littered by the Ministry of the Culture because in historical landmarks. In the 1980, uh, 1991, we finished a project called the Umbrellas. Joint project for Japan in the United States. There was 1,340 umbrellas in Japan, and 1,760 umbrellas in Southern California. It was like diptych, the work of part to be seen simultaneously. In 1985, 1995, we finished project. We worked for over 25 years, the wrapping the Reichstag, the former parliament of Germany. You know very well is the uh, building who today is the parliament of Germany. And for four weeks, we have uh, 5 million people coming to see the rice tech. In the 1998, uh, we did the rough trees and Berover Park in Fundacion Bayler and Basel, Switzerland. And the 19, uh, uh, you have a sunny days, we have a winter, this uh, late autumn, and we have uh, this sunset in the tree. In the 19, uh, 2005, after 26 years, we get the permission to install 7,503 gates in Central Park in the autumn or in the early uh, winter days when we have a leafless tree, we have a, uh, the gate with a six meter high running for these uh, 23 kilometers. And we have a sunny days and we have a snow. I remember Jean-Claude was saying, not sure, but we have a snow and these 16 days. And you see, actually it's very bleaching color, Vladimir. It's something, huh? It's a projector. It's a projector, I'm sorry. It's my fault, you know. They are not that colors, you know. I cannot do more, better. The projector is not proper. Okay. Now we come to the, we come to the barrels. This is the story come from late 50s when uh, we were living in Paris. You know, I live in Paris between 58 and 64. I do a lot of sculpture with barrels and tin cans. You can see part of a certain serpentine gallery. But this is our, our second public works with Jean-Claude myself, we did our iron curtain. We just built two, one years later that Berlin Wall's wall was built in August 1961. And this is the structure barricading the street in Paris. This is the first actually type of mother barrel museum collection in Milano. And using the barrels, we start to propose to do a large structure. And then I, in the, in the, in the mid-60s, we proposed to build smaller size master bar in between Houston and Galveston, we never get permission. And uh, in the night, early 70s, we try to do it in Holland, when you have a museum who collects very much my early works, but also we never get permission. And finally, we arrived in Abu Dhabi in 1979, and we proposed to build Mastaba of 410,000 barrels, stacking structure who will be 150 meters high by 225 meters by 300 meters, and is built by this 
uh, multicolor barrels. Actually, each vertical wall have 110,000 barrels with 10 different colors. We spent tremendous time traveling in Abu Dhabi and actually collecting here the sand for the, the scale model, you can see in Serpentine Gallery, myself, Jean-Claude, and the site of Abu Dhabi in 1979. And here you can see the site, actually the last time Jean-Claude was there in early 2000 for the site of the project. You know, this project got to the many steps, and I can tell you, myself and Jean-Claude, we're not specialists. We need to hire services of many specialists, and here, we, for example, we have a services of the uh, uh, discussing with the Professor Sasaki of Jose University of Tokyo, how to build the barrels. And Professor Sasaki have a great idea that the biggest problem, we need to install 410,000 barrels. It's very much the same way how the barrels was uh, position here in the master bar of uh, Serpentine Lake. And Professor Sasaki have an idea to flattening the project. Basically, we go ahead, Vladimir, that it will be flat and master bar will be built like that. It will be elevated in 10 days vertically after install 410,000 barrels. You see, this is the something that no building in the world is built like that. It's taller than pyramid of Cheops. We give you the size of the project now Vladimir, this is the pyramid of the Kiops. You have the Bastaba there. And uh, <clears throat> the footprint of Bastaba, without knowing, is the, the footprint of Bernini Square and Vatican. And this is how the Bastaba there. All this project involved a lot of work. Here we are on the side, which Vladimir, our engineers, was positioning the, the orientation, of vertical, orientation of vertical wall. If we see the, uh, the, our flag poles, on a car there, that is the footprint of the master bar. And the next slide, you will see the cars, you know how master bar is high up there, little balloon on the height. And uh, this is the non-stop ticking, talking like tonight, the countless presentation on Women's College in Abu Dhabi. Here, uh, let me next. Here is the study for the project. Drawings, I do, you see many of these drawings. We sell and to pay the bills to this project. This is temporary installation of 13,000 barrels in the Museum of Oberhausen in Germany. You see that museum have an atrium. When you have an update, you can see that from above. And now, the next one, and that is the story of the floating, first floating master bus, smaller size, and Lake Michigan that only stay in the sites of the project. And here, the images of the third drawings. They, you know, these are drawings I do with my hands. I have no assistant in my studio, and this is master bus of the Serpentine Lake. And we were running a few photographs of Master of Serpentine Lake. And after that, I will finish with the, the, the project just before the Master of Serpentine Lake is the story of the project in the Lake Iseo. Now, you should know that all these projects in the last 50 years, we realized 23 projects where we failed to get permission for 47 projects. Some project was refused. If we don't like to do it, some project was uh, refused several times, we try to do it. That is the first idea for the floating pier that we try to do it. And, and the uh, delta of Rio de la Plata to Argentina is the only like idea we never get permission. After the umbrellas, we try to do the, because we have a lot of friends in Japan, we try to do it in Tokyo Bay and the area of Daiba, also we never get permission. And finally, this is the sketches, the first preliminary sketches for the floating pier. Living in France between 58 and 64, very familiar with the lake of northern Italy, I was eager to do something because I hoped to get the permission easily. And this is a little lake of Iseo that we install our project. We have a mountain. You know, this is lake who was a former uh, glacier. This is very deep, deep water of 90 meters to 220 meters of deep water. And we realized the project. I will run very fast the course. This is all the sketches. This is how the project was built in the site of Lake Iseo. This is probably how they installed this over 200 anchors, 5,000 on each. How this project was engineering, very simply, to float. This is the balloon carrying the five tons anchor underneath. And this is how they was installed. This is all the teamwork each project is realizing, involving a lot of uh, putting together people. And this is the, our working site. This is our staging area. Basically, three kilometer floating pier was put on three, 30 long uh, floating piers 
that need to be put together, Louis Menex. This is like, for example, framing the little island of Sao Paulo, bringing material by helicopter to put on the floating pier, unfurling the fabric, and uh, this is all. And this is a satellite picture of how the project was looking before we occupied for 1,250,000 people for 16 days. Now, they walk in the water. Uh, they walk day and night. Uh, they were coming from the mainland of uh, and the, uh, about two and a half kilometers pedestrian street was also covered in these medieval towns. And, uh, and the people was walking. You see something very important. That project only can happen in Italy. This is the very dead bottle, 220 meters here. Another is about 100 meters wide. Think what is impossible to do any place except in Italy. But I will answer the question. Look at well on that, how many people walk. And this day and night, we have a special light bring from California to be installed, battery. And, and this is how the project looks in the night. And now, here the people walking. <laughs> Look for something. What is, you know, this is 200 meters deep water. They are no rail. Okay, now we can put the lights. And uh, Hans Uri courageously come to the stage. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we, we... But before we start, another big round of applause for Crystal. <laughs> And I'm not going to ask you many questions, because I think it is a wonderful idea that this is a very polyphonic conversation tonight, and we can have all your questions, what you always wanted to ask Chris. So I'm just going to ask you two or three questions. One is, you showed us, you know, because we all experience every day the amazing Mastaba mirrored in, in the lake. Uh, but of course, the project for the desert uh, it has not been realized yet. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about this project? Because something even very different will happen there with yeah. the light. You know, uh, <clears throat> you know, this is the uh, very important to understand. Some project they design for a particular place. In some project we have idea, we need to find the right place. The case that the rice tag was designed for the rice tag, the case was designed for Central Park, but the story like of Running Fence, California, we have idea to be, build fence. Finally, we have the location north of San Francisco. Rap Coast was not designed for Australia. <laughs> it was designed for California in 1967, 68. We never get permission. And by chance, and finally, we arrive in Australia when they have the biggest coastline in the world. And the case with the Mastaba is the same thing. You know, it's a project. We try to do it in uh, Texas, between Houston and Galveston. We try to do it in Holland. And again, I was not. Uh, uh, putting my finger on the maps and then go to the Middle East. Uh, I tell you, it's a not short story. I can tell you frankly how it's happened. It's not secret. Uh, uh, this is 1971, 72. We have a visit of the French representative to United Nations in New York, who was the collector. And he advises that if we cannot do the project in Texas, we cannot do the project in Holland, try our energy to do project in the country it was just created in 1979 called United Arab Emirates. I never heard about that. I go to books and geography and find it that was the British protectorate and after they became independent union of seven Sheikhdom and we were dreaming that to go there. But to go there was so impossible in the early 70s that nothing was happening, no way simple person can go there. And when Giscard d'Estaing was elected president of France, nominated our friends, Monsieur Louis de Guirangot, who became foreign secretary of France. And I remember vividly Jean-Claude sent telegram, Louis, we like to go to Abu Dhabi. And our arrivals in Abu Dhabi was organized by the French Foreign Office. And after that is the story. You know, all our projects have this story. If uh, Mrs. Susmut was not elected president of the German parliament after having Set three times refusal of the project, and she not appeared to be president of parliament, probably the rest of would never up. If Mr. Bloomberg, who I know for many years before even thinking to be a mayor, by chance decided to be a mayor, 
the guests probably never be realized. Basically, the many story of our life happened by the circumstance or encounter that they cannot make provision. And this is also the story of Abu Dhabi. We arrived there in 1979, and that all became part of our existence, Jacques and myself. She was born in Morocco. She had a great affection to the desert. She lived in Northern Africa. And she was absolutely excited to return back in the same landscape. And the project started to grow from that very simple proposal. And actually, the model he was seen in Serpent and Gary was built in 1979. The sand and the model was brought by myself, Jean Claude, in 1979. And, and it's not only to build the things, it's, each project involved also the site. The story of the Mastaba in the Middle East is that we like to have that site, that the project should have a 16 square kilometer reserve for the project. Four kilometer by four kilometer, nothing should be built. Part of the landscape became part of the project. All that is the very complex uh, process to secure the decision making or permission. And of course, it's very different from permission in the Reichstag, permission in another country in the world, is the kingdom, is the type of, is very political and involving huge amount of uh, advisor we need to hire, we need to pay services of professional people to work with us to move the project ahead. It's fascinating in the presentation, you know, we saw, um, and also in the exhibition at the Southern Time, there are these extraordinary drawings, these very painterly drawings uh, you make, and you make them uh, until the very moment the project yes. opens, and then it stops. Yes. Can you tell us I, about that? I do not make drawings before, after the project is realized. They are also these drawings, in some way they trace the evolution of the project. I never have very clear idea what is the project. And uh, because it's impossible to imagine how the project will look. This is why the very early drawings of each project is more schematic, more simplistic, because I do not know how the project will look, how the project will be built. And, and uh, I, I tell you that nothing can be chosen in my studio in Manhattan. We live in all industrial building, and we're using all the building. My studio is top elevator, uh, no elevator, top floor. And uh, it's not clean since 1964. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and in that studio, I put many pieces. But physically, we cannot choose the project, the material and mechanics of the project. We need to do life size test secretly in some places, meaning like one-to-one -one scale, small sides of the project with the real material, real elements. And you don't know where it was the life size test of uh, serpentine like done. Was done last year, life size test, far away from here where my nephew Vladimir half house in the southern border of Bulgaria near Turkish border and the Black Sea. And there was the life size test that we fly our English people, our uh, 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 engineers, our Bulgarian people, our German people, and they was participating in that life size. Jenny, Jenny is here? Yes, here. The young poor Jenny was working through, to, under permission, he was there. And there we built Mastava with all these colors, with, uh, correcting many things, designing many things, more smaller size, but actually with the real material. For each of our projects, do exactly the same thing. And one thing uh, I wanted to ask you, which you haven't mentioned in the talk tonight, but which I think would be interesting, would be this incredible independence and autonomy you have, and you and Jean-Claude uh, have always had in, in realizing these projects. Because you explained to us early on that there, there are never commissions. From the very beginning, yeah. they are not commissions. And there is today even a course at Harvard Business School about Christo and Jean-Claude and how you produce reality. Can you explain to us a little bit how actually these miracles are concretely? No, no, not miracles, no. <laughs> uh, first, uh, I was born in Bulgaria many years ago in uh, communist time, and I was educated Marxist. You know. <laughs> and uh, coming to the West, basically, we use the capitalist system to the very end to do to, to the things I like to do. Uh, and come to the story that our lawyer from Chicago, uh, Scott Horace advises that we need to create a company, corporation, non-non-profit corporation, a real corporation, was, to, was created to build our project, to sell our original work of art, and to buy back our original work of art. And that corporation is called CBG Corporation, holding company in the state of New York and state of Delaware. And that company, when you do project outside of uh, these two states, 
created subsidiary. There was the Reister Corporation, German company. There was the California and Japanese Corporation, the Umbrella in Japan. There was the Italian Corporation from the Floating Pier. And there, London Mastaba Corporation from the project here. Each corporation is involving a higher the services of professional people, workforce, etc. But the money comes from the CVG Corporation. Now, some of your artists, you know that artists have things produced with their hands called painting, a sculpture, or installations, and uh, the gallery exhibit them, and the sometimes gallery advance money because artists should have a on front money for to do his things. But sometimes the uh, collectors buying the work, and the work is very expensive, and so often collectors, and even also corporations, pay an installment because the work is so many hundreds of thousand dollars. Uh, but uh, uh, we, our project will not be pay an installment. We need to have a cash flow, like any works force. And because I never have exclusivity with any gallery, we work with many galleries, a private dealer, uh, we found ourselves that we are the biggest collector of our work. We have enormous storage, storages, but our principal storage is in Basel, Switzerland. We have our own uh, conservator uh, involving with the project, Josie Kraft, with the storages. And that storage is our um, wealth that we can have standby lines of credit with the banks. And not secret, I work with Citibank, we work with Julius Bank and Zurich, with Liechtenstein Bank or Bank of uh, uh, Citibank or Deutsche Bank. And, uh, and actually, from some years now, we we're working with Credit Suisse. And this is why we have a cash flow. We sometimes borrow money, but sometimes we have the money stay there and we pay rent, it's not secret. For $10 million standby money, we pay $150,000 rent a year. Not very much. <laughs> If we borrow money, we pay the interest. This is how we have the independence. It can work building this project. And that's what so many you know, young artists keep telling me are inspired by, that you have this incredible independence to produce reality. Now, Rainer Maria Rilke, and that shall be my last question, so you can already start to prepare all your questions for Christo. My last question is, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote this lovely little book, which is an advice to a young poet. Yes. And um, I see many young artists here in, uh, in the audience tonight. What would be today, in 2018, your advice to a young artist? Oh, Jean could have a beautiful answer for that. You know, I should tell you that <laughs> I, well, I'm obliged to go to the jury only from the New York State, you know, you're black to I refuse to jury anybody in art. Who I am to, who I am to ju advise somebody who I'm not them. That is impossible. <laughs> and uh, things Jean-Claude was always saying, <laughs> the only things we can advise you, that you do the things you like to do. But the biggest story is to know what you like to do. And that is no advice for that. Only you can find what you like to do. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. You. Now we can put more light. They're not so light in the public, but anyway. Yeah, if you can have a bit more light. Yeah, light, light to see that yeah, if somebody on. question come. We've got a question here in the front row. Hello. Yes. Hello, good evening. I'm very good interested <laughs> to see that your installation is in a marine-based environment. It right? Is. It's in the serpentine. It's actually touching the water. Is that right? Inspir I don't understand. Inspiration? It's in the water. It's in the water. Walk in the water? The, your art is sitting in the serpentine, isn't it? Ah, the pr sculpture sitting is floating on the surface of the water. It's floating on the surface of the water. And as someone who's been around boats my entire life, I know that it's painted in beautiful colors. And if that were water-based paint, that would wash off. So it must be an oil-based paint, which leaches into the water. So uh -huh. I'm interested in your environmental assessment, um, the impact on the serpentine. And it's not just the runoff 
of that toxic um, off-gas material. Environmentally, yeah. Um, that's an important situation. It is a question. No, no, I'm not finished. No. Um, no, but he, no, no, she's not finished the question. There's delay. the disposal of the materials, which aren't, which aren't just the gas, gas barrels that we already have. They're now covered in extra paint. And also, when you install something, the, the wildlife around it will adapt to that installation, and they will change their patterns of behavior. So I'm interested, and here's my question. What is the environmental impact assessment? How did you do that? What was the outcome of that environmental impact assessment? And how are you offsetting the, dam Miti the mitigating. damage? Mitigating yeah. and mitigating the, the damage. And how are you going to recycle all those materials? How we how I, what, how? Ah, uh, okay, okay, starting with recycling. Question of the environment. Yeah, okay, recycle. You know, yeah, yeah. understand, all this material we do, we use, is material existing in the industrial world. We uh, actually can tell you best example. There are many examples of recycling, but taking the case. You don't know to build these 13, 7,503 gates in Central Park, we need to have a base to support these gates. We buy, bought five, thousand tons of steel. We have a slide is there for its 5,000 tons of steel. 5,000 tons of steel is the two-thirds of the steel of Eiffel Tower. We bought that steel and it was cut in pieces that support the 7,000 gates. But actually, we sold the steel before even use her for the gates to the Chinese because they need steel to build skyscrapers. You understand, all this material is immediately your cell for the uses who is created. Now, the barrels material is steel, it's go back to be a steel. The, 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 every this material you, we're using, they go back to what they used to be. And this is, they already recycled before if they stay for two months or two, two weeks in the project. And the, all the material, for example, all the material is in material very solid. The paint is not bleaching in the lake. That is very strong paint. It does not happen anything in the lake. Not more than the boat, like the boat floating in the lake. Now, our, our mitigation for the park is that, for the lake, is that the lake was clean just before Olympic Games 10, 10 years. Yeah. Was clean. This. The answer to this question. <laughs> okay. More questions for Christo? We've got two questions here in the middle. No, but more questions. I can answer all questions. Three questions here. I'm not tired. <laughs> but there's going to be many more. Order, it has order, only order. just begun. Yeah, I'm <laughs> but Hi there, Christo. Um, your works inspired me uh, when I was young and studying art at school. It's a great honor to be here. Um, your works are very uh, impressive, very grand. They have a lot of uh, spectacle. What do you think the role is of uh, spectacle in, uh, in the viewers' lives who come to your works? Um, what do you think you're doing by uh, putting that kind of uh, uh, experience in their day-to-day -day world? What you're doing by putting this, you know, spectacle into the day-to-day. -day okay. It's a question of spectacle. No spectacle, but you know, the, in beyond the spectacle, uh, you know, you know, the uh, their visual arts, their painting, sculpture, today installation. The painting is flat surface like that, you know, and it can be abstract, realistic, but it's the flat surface. The sculpture usually is something go around like like that, so like Giacometti, go around. But is all this, that space is designed by artists. 
uh, like some uh, call there with like pieces, you go inside the space. This is the traditional space. And today, even the artists make this installation and gallery and the rooms, we pos position television here, something there, some object there. But that space is entirely directly designed by the artist. That space, who the art world deal. Now, there another space, we never think, what is that? The moment you walk out of, from your home, you walk on the sidewalk, somebody designed the sidewalk. The moment you cross the street, you have a rated green light, somebody decided that. Basically, 24 hours around the clock, you funnel to highly regulated space. You're never thinking about it. Go to airports, all that place is designed by the urban planner, regulation, you moving there, going like that, is that space you use it for your existence in life. Now, Jean-Claude was very much saying that we come to that space, borrow that space, if we created gentle disturbances. By borrowing that space, we inherit everything in that space to become part of the work of art. We do not invent the politics in the Reichstag, but in the Reichstag. We don't invent ecology in Biscayne Bay, Florida. It is that Biscayne Bay. Basically, they're not illustration. It's the real things. It's not virtual image. It's not photograph of people fighting or people suffering. It's the real things. The real wind, the real kilometer, the real wet, the real dry, the real water, the real things. And of course, you can see that this project has many similarities in the permitting process. They're not related to art, visual art. They're often related to, uh, to urbanism and architecture. When the Reichstag was wrapped, the first uh, critic New York Times sent was not art critic, was architectural critic. Because Reich, Rapp Reichstag was architecture. If you read this project, you will see there in beyond the normal realm of the so-called visual arts, they deal with like umbrellas, like building houses and kilometers, kilometers area. And the process to get that permission is also very similar on the process like to build highway or bridges or skyscraper. Meaning that that is essential part of this project that we do not do commission. This is another more important. Why we not do the commission? Because all our projects have two distinct periods. The software period and the hardware period. The soft period where the project do not exist. It exists only on my drawings and sketches and the mind of people who try to help us in the mind of people who try to stop us. <laughs> Meaning that for months or years, people discussing about something who do not exist. <laughs> Ask how many artists can tell you that is so much writing, but, but painting do not exist, or the sculpture. Basically, that, proje that project developed participatory public by themselves, public who visualized, uh, anticipated, and thinking about the project. That is the software period. And the hardware period, when the, we start to build the real things, the real kilometers, the real cables, the real, real things, not photographs, not imagination. And all that created that public, it cannot invent it. It's not, uh, not the invited public. Public is there. You, this is why we like to do this project. They are beyond normal public and museum and gallery and exhibition. This is because we borrow the space what thousands or million people use. Inavoidable, they have woven in that space, and this is when the project is realized, have a, this type of people who come. And the very end, after 50 years, we have a people who they're not art collectors, they're groupies. They come to see something once in a lifetime. We never do the same things again. There will be no other umbrellas, there will be no other running fence, there no, no other rap bridge, they are all walking in the water. They're unique things, like because all of us, they're unique. Nobody of us is, have somewhere double, somewhere well. And we're in that world of banality, repetitious, the same thing you say. Football world cases, Olympic games, they're all the same story. We're all unique, and we like to present as something is unique like us. Now, it's, it's interesting in, in relation to this question, Chris, so that the projects have uh, a limited lifespan, that yeah. they, they are not there forever. Yeah. Um, and that's something which you always emphasize is importance. They are there, and then they are gone. Yeah. 
Of course, they, uh, they also, uh, <laughs> it's part of, uh, because I'm not very young, I'm 83, it's part of my life. I remember when Rafael was still alive, we were talking like old generals, and sometimes we're talking on the time of Valley Curtain, we know, 72, the time of running fence is 76, or the time of Rice Lake is 1995. We're referring because there are slides of my life, a life of some friends, and there something exists cannot be substituted. The moment this project happened, they happened some very incredible moments. We have more questions here in the middle, three, four. Let's go. And here. the gentleman here have a. Yeah, and young then we have a question here. in the front row after yeah. that. Yeah. Hi. Um, it's a question about time. So. As the idea of a temporary project, uh, to, I guess to a young person, is quite romantic, and like you've done so many decades of these temporary projects, so basically my question is, do you think about that temporality any differently now than you did before? No. First thing, no. There are two, there's some kind of double talk here. I do also permanent things, you know. If I do my drawings and scale on the sculpture, the people will not buy them and I have no money. Of course, I do hundreds of permanent things in the museum and collection. Well, of course, the large projects are temporary. Of course, that is one thing. But they're also designed to captivate it. that particular moment cannot be can. The moment of that software period and after the hardware period, that's expectation. It cannot be can, cannot be can, cannot be kept. It. And that the energy, and it's very on, very on, the project is something there Nobody can own, even myself can own all this. This is why they should go, because they're absolutely total freedom, totally unnecessary. They exist because I myself and some friends like to have it. There is no reason to be justified they exist. They exist because I have this unstoppable urge to do it. There are no rational things that I tell, I don't like to just be justified, you know, and so many projects we failed to realize because the people stopped me. I never get permission. It's because I was sad, I suffer, I scream, and tearing myself apart. But this is part of my life. And I love that energy. This is something I build like that. And to the end of my life, I do things like that. <laughs> yes, all right. The, the, the young the man here. Uh, the the young man here. The I come for you, madame. Thank you very much for the talk and your answers have been incredible. Um, I'm curious, which artists have inspired you across your career? Um, have I forget it to say something before the lecture. I'm sorry, this is Jean-Claude. We will not talk about politics, religion, and not about other artists. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is, I forget it. This is John. <laughs> Hi, Christo. I would like to start by saying thank you for generously gifting yet another piece of yours to the world and to all of us to enjoy. I have two questions for you, and the first one concerns the Mastaba here in London, and the second one cons concerns the place you were born in. So my first question is, the Mastaba looks particularly captivating at sunset. Could you please tell us a little bit more about how you positioned it and how you had it in your mind so you can reach that perfection? Of Especially the at, and, yes, and the, the Mastaba at sunset. Yeah, okay. And, my, okay. and my second question oh, okay. is, since you mentioned Bulgaria a few times in the beginning of the lecture, how do you feel about executing a project back home? Okay, I Thank understand. Thank you. I understand. Now, you should, understand, uh, you should try, to, I try to say before, the drawings and the sketches, the scale model, they really cannot translate how the project will be. In the very end, I, we do not know how the project will look. We cannot speculate it. We cannot, uh, with computer, visualize. I know that I was astonished the change of the color of the master of Serpentine Lake, because I never expected that would happen. You know, all our projects have this tremendous dimension, which is much larger than all our prefiguration before. It cannot be even compared. 
the dynamics of this project. And I know that the color of vertical wall changing in the sunset, it became like a Byzantine mosaic. Then I never think will happen. We never believe it. They cannot even visualize it in advance. Now, for Bulgaria, you know, I left Bulgaria at the age of 21. I never been out from any uh, city, any country that, that time. During the communist regime, I was persecuted by the communists. I have no rights to travel. I'm also Czech. My grandmother is Czech. And I've succeeded to have permission to go to Czechoslovakia to see my relatives, another communist country, Soviet bloc country. And I arrived in September of 1956 in Prague. And that moment, already, the Hungarian revolution was in process. The Soviet tank was in Budapest. There was the violence. and the, British and French flight airplanes were bombarding the Suez Canal because it was nationalized. Everybody was thinking the third world will start, and there was turmoil in all the world. And, and by coming from Bulgaria, where I was not allowed to study any language except Russian and Bulgarian, only to be privileged to study other foreign languages, I can only speak Russian and Bulgarian. I was not capable to speak any other language. Basically, I have no rights to anything. I never saw original works of modern art. I saw few works in Prague, but not in Bulgaria. And I escaped alone, not like the family here walking in the woods for somebody, alone. No, ch no father, no brothers, no anybody. Alone, myself, I was in the West, not speaking anything. And it was very difficult. I don't I'll go to that. And of course, I make my way, and 21 years old, arriving in Vienna, where already stood in the Fine Arts Academy in Bulgaria, where I like to go. Of course, you like to go to Paris, what we stay in Vienna, Austria. And I did my way through Switzerland, and I arrived in Paris in 1958, when General de Gaulle just was asked to come to power again. And I remember arriving in the Champs Elysees, there was the tanks and army because there was the Algerian war going ahead. But I have a chance to meet Jean Claude in 19, November 1958. She was a French. And after that is a story. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now the, the Bulgaria, you know, uh, to be frankly tell you, all my, all my life, for example, myself and friends, we do projects when the people like my works of art. Meaning that my first personal exhibition by circumstance was in Germany, Cologne, 61. I'm not German. I have no any relation to Germany. Since 1961, we have so many German collectors, museum people, interested in my art. I live in France. I have collectors in France, but I have much more collectors in Italy. I have much more collectors in Switzerland, more collectors in Holland, Belgium, and all these places where do people who buy art. I uh, have collectors in Australia, and of course, we have a collector in Japan. I have no any collectors in China. No collectors in Russia. Why I should go there? No, basically, basically all this project has happened when the people, people like my art. Like my art, meaning that, Jean Claude, like my art, to buy my art. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to like it, but to buy my art, because without buying my art, I have no money to build my project. <laughs> and I, last year, two years ago, I was invited to the museum, World Museum Conference Milano, and with many directors of many museums around the world, <laughs> and one museum director came tell, <laughs> that why we not come to my country to do project? I ask him how many Christians you have? None. Why should go to his country? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have no reason to go if there is no disaffection, disinterest. That is very simple human relation. Got a question here, two questions. Thanks. OK, the lady with the yellow, yellow hat. Yes, with my umbrella's hat. Umbrella's hat, yes. yes. Um, I worked on several of your projects when I was younger. And I came to Isio, and I just loved walking on the water. But what I also loved was seeing the exhibition in Isio with the models of some of the projects we'd worked on. Yeah. And I wondered when you could bring some of that exhibition to London. The umbrellas exhibition? No, the exhibition that was in Isio. You had models of the umbrellas the and the surrounded you islands. You had it in Italy, and you had the lake and the... Ah, with the exhibition about the floating pier. Yes. Of course, we have an exhibition only devoted to floating pier, but we need to have a good museum for that. 
Each, okay, I should tell you, very important, I forget it's very important before the question. All this temporary project, they're temporary, but we are very uh, conscious that we need to have some kind of staying of this project. And through the making original works of art before the project is realized, I draw many sketches and drawings, but I put aside the works of that project, that original work, to be not sold. When the project is remo removed, we collect also components of the real project, pole, cables, materials, uh, scale model, diagram of engineers. Uh, we film, we photograph all the meetings, everything. And each of our projects have a huge document documentary exhibition between 300 to 500 pieces telling the story of the project, and we like to keep this exhibition together, that they are archive material that is very good for the research, that the people can see the real thing, not interpretation. And we are not very young, Jean-Claude and myself, and I remember Jean-Claude very, before she passed away, she tried to think, for example, running fence documentation exhibition for the project in Northern California was bought by the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. You have uh, all the story of running fence. Photographs, drawings, sketches, scale models, material, components, cable, fabric, public hearings, etc. There are also exhibition of story of the Reistech project. And the German Foundation bought an entire exhibition of the Reistech project. Actually, now is exhibited in the second floor of Germany, and he can go to that second floor in Berlin Reichstag. He can see it, of course, on the floor where the senator and congressman work, but he can have a private tour to see that exhibition. We have an exhibition like that about Pondov, surrounded talent, the umbrellas, the gates, all this exhibition in storage in, in Basel. They are also part, part of the collaterals. We work with the banks. And of course, we are very eager, not yet the exhibition of floating pyramids, but it is existing, and we're eager to have the exhibition of floating pier at some museum. Often we use also this exhibition to sensitize place where we like to do the project. For example, when to get the permission for the Reichstag project, we moved the Pond of Documentation exhibition to the museum in the Kunstmuseum in Bonn, when the capital of Germany was born, that the parliamentarian can see how urban project in Europe was realized to make some analogy. At the same time, when we try to get the blue umbrellas in Japan by the government of Japan give us permission, we moved the Surrounded Island exhibition, the Pink Islands of Florida, to many museums in Japan and to public to be see how one project was realized. And of course, there was one thing to tell you, but you were probably so we are not born but many years ago. We show an Institute of Contemporary Art in London, 1979, running fence documentation exhibition, which is now in Smithsonian, Washington, was exhibited here. And we I would be very happy to bring another exhibition. We have a, all this exhibition ready to be sure how one project is realized. So, so you've got all these exhibitions, but there is one exhibition you don't want to do. You always told me you don't want to do retrospectives. Okay, no retro because that's interesting, you know, okay. because there are okay. many exhibitions. Okay, I will answer that question. No, first, <laughs> I, I like I like to die like Jean Claude. She died right away. She have a hemorrhage. He died right away. I don't like to be sick. I like to die right away. Basically, uh, I don't. I feel good health, in good shape. I don't like to spend one minute of my life for something was there in the back. I don't have a time. I have no interest to have a retrospective. I don't have interest to discussing what I did 50 years ago or 40 years ago. This is why I like to keep more energy for the future project. We have a project, for example, right now. We not, cannot tell you what it's yet because it's not yet public. <laughs> and of course, they, they project all the time ahead. There are other projects. We, we have a plans. But I'm so excited to do this thing. This is why I don't like to lose my time. I, I, I was very happy to do that small sculpture in the Lake, uh, Lake Serpentine Lake, to have some idea of that small overview of exhibition of the barrels for this year, to make some connection to the public, how the, I work with the, master, with the barrels. But basically, all my energy is for the future. Now, the, the other question. And now, <laughs> All the energy is for the future, and there are many questions here, but we should quickly move up also, because we shouldn't forget the upstairs floor. We have questions here. I'm I, I, I looking, not a balcony. It's ah, balcony. In balcony, yeah, yeah. First, first row. The lady with the arms up. Exactly, in the front row. <laughs> in the front row. Okay. 
<laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Um, the floating piece was the first of your artworks that I had the pleasure of experiencing for myself. And what struck me about it was the diversity of people that, um, that was simply there. They were walking, they, weren't, they were talking, they weren't buying anything, they weren't consuming, they weren't paying for, every, for anything. I mean, we paid to get there, but we didn't. Um, and, and it was very, a very different experience from how we normally experience both art and our own social relations. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, these new social relations that you mentioned uh, work, your works create? If I, I predict it or see, I don't understand the question. If I... Yeah, so basically the floating peels... Yeah, you know, I know, but what I, if I... People didn't consume, and, and uh, it's a different experience, and if you can talk a little bit about the social you know, situation you create, in a way. <laughs> no, okay. New social yeah, situation. I understand the question, no. Uh, because I said before, I'm so eager to do new work, I cannot tell you tell you what the project makes people think. You know, I, I, am not, I have no time to interview, to see how the people react. It's not my business, you know, the story. Uh, I, I'm, I, I love the project created that dynamics, but I cannot start to discussing, etc. I give an example, uh, because it's something, the project is so bigger than uh, my imagination, bigger any prediction. When we did the project, the umbrellas in Japan and United States, there was a project diptych, like a classical painting. You have two paintings. They are complementing each other. The project was involving the two richest countries in the world that time, 91, United States, is Japan, with a lot of similarity, a lot of differences. And all that starts already from the beginning. It was enchanting confrontation with that. When the, we need to hire non-skilled workers for the project, we were talking we're talking to University in California to have workers to come to be subscribed after a lecture like that. First, we ask question now, and the first question of American students, how much the project will cost and who pay for that? <laughs> of course, we answer with that. We fly to Japan, we talk to University in Tokyo to Japan, the same thing. First question, why blue, why yellow? <laughs> All start a different similarity. And of course, the project involved all type of things. For example, we built the umbrella, who is not because Japanese left umbrella. Umbrella was not invent, invented in Japan. It's invented in a country called Mesopotamia 7,000 years ago. But anyway, the umbrella was there. And uh, this umbrella was very tall, uh, eight meter high. And you have a big base, like a floor, that you can sit uh, picnicking in the, the umbrellas. The Americans were driving uh, with their blanket. They're picnicking the umbrellas. Japan, Japanese people were driving, but what they did, they removed their shoes. And they started to walk on the sitting platform, but because of the floor at home in Japan, you don't walk with the shoes. Basically, the project developed his own interpretation on the way how the people accept or uh, assimilate the work. This is why we're not really possible to see how the project on multi-level is accepted. It's not my business, it's the business of art historians or specialists, not for myself. This is why all these projects, they are bigger than my imagination, my imagination. This is why I cannot think about that. This is open uh, interpretation. And all interpretation is legitimate because people think like that. I cannot myself think how the Germans saw the Reichstag. I'm not German. No, this is the story. Now, the other question was? Yeah, we've got one more question here on the balcony. On the balcony there, the lady on the left side. Yeah, yeah. left and right, we've got one each. Oh, Let's then, take this question, no? I see the lady with the arm, but there's no microphone. Oh, there, where? Ah, oh, here, here, okay. Okay, hi. Um, it's, you have been such an inspiration to me, and I am so honored to see you in real life. My question is, there must be a period of time for, from your imagination on 2D to become 3D. And I wonder if you ever go through self-doubt and how you deal with that. it. TV. If you ever go through <laughs> self-doubt, it's the question of self-doubt. Do you ever have self-doubt? <laughs> doubting. Self-doubt. Yeah. Of course, <laughs> I have. A, of course, uh, I, first, you know, uh, 
all the things I think in mind, I hope I can manage doing. They're very simple. Very simple, they're not complicated. They have, in generic wise, they're very, very ordinary, very simple. Uh, I never try to do the things who cannot manage. Is uh, You know, first, you should understand, it's not myself. <laughs> we need to hire people to do this project. You know, they, I'm not alone. And this is the incredible, most difficult part, is to put together a team, incredible team, incredible group of people, professionals. And we're not always right. We hire some, we need to fire because they're not the right people. There's many incredible process of putting together a team. And this is the, probably one of the most difficult part, very complicated. And this is why I like to do this project. They're not something I do. I need to be, like example, we give the example of the master of United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi. We're not engineers, and Jean-Claude had this incredible idea that she needs to know how the project will be built. That idea of Professor Sazaki not come like that. They had a huge book, like a telephone book, all time, called Shanghai Codex, where it classified in the generic school in the world from one to 500. We had the services of the top of the list in generic school, like a one to 30. We had services of Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, services of the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom, uh, Champagne you know, in the United States, Jose, Jose University in Tokyo, Japan. These professors and their, their, their assistants have the proportion of the project, how to, we like to look, but, it, but they don't know each other to have or other. We hire the services, to so pay the services, and all that was done, taken hundred, thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to, of our, their money. We received this full study, very in-depth study, how cost, etc. And we don't know what is the best. We already know that Professor Sazaki is the best. We submitted that to another great engineer at the University of Berlin to advise us. And he advises his Professor Sazaki test is the most incredible to do, do the project like that. But all that is cost money. It costs tremendous amount of professional resources we need to hire. The same things with all the project of uh, uh, the Middle East, I do not know, I, can, I cannot talk myself into high the services of highly professional people who, who can organize the process of the permits. It's a very complex process of the permits. You need to find the right people to introduce us, the right people talk to the right people in the royal families. All these things is the very long process. And this is why uh, sometimes we make a lot of mistakes. We regret, I scream, spend a lot of money. <laughs> we try to repair. There are no open avenue, and this is why some projects never happen. So we've got one last question here on the balcony, and then we will move down again. And if you can please speak the, very loudly, because for whatever reasons, here on stage, like it's difficult to hear yeah. the question. So if you can please lady, speak uh, loudly into the microphone. We take the last question on the balcony, Hi. and then... Hi. But, it, but the lady in the front also. Absolutely. Her. Okay. Hi, where, where, is the, where is that? Me. Here. There. Hi, okay, there. okay, very good, okay. Thank you, uh, thank you for tonight. I think my question is more, I'm very curious about how was the collaboration between you and Jean-Claude? Like, how was the dynamic uh, working together? How was? Yes. Now, okay, that should do something very important, and I try to tell you, they can do that. You know, we have a uh, look, g luck and chance, uh, in 1961, before we come to New York, to meet one of the greatest documentary movie makers of cinema verite, Albert and David Mezels. Probably you don't know them, but they did the famous Sto Rolling Stone film, Gimme Shelter, and the Grey Gardens, if you some film people know about that. And Albert and David Mezels did many films on our work, from the Valley Curtain to the Running Friends, the Umbrellas, to that. And uh, you should try to organize some screening of these films, because... <laughs> Because they're cinema verite films, they're not art documentary films. You can see myself, Jean-Claude, screaming, fighting each other to understand how we're working, how we're arguing, and how we, she told you stupid, and I think you don't understand what I'm saying. Anyway, it's the life story, it's not narration, not art historian talking about film, it's the real making. I can tell you the project of the Gates film, uh, 
project take uh, uh, um, 26 years uh, to have the gates, and the film of the gates have footage from all these 26. The same, all these projects have the footage of me became older and older through the years. Basically, you should see that is the very uh, enriching, very human relation. Uh, she was very critical. I would never, uh, I miss all the time. She was argumentative, critical, <laughs> objecting all the time, and that became to a lot of fights. I fight with her ferociously, <laughs> screaming, it's not, nothing, we don't, only for the decision making. Sometimes, even we sometimes don't talk two days because we have different <laughs> opinions, you know. This is the, how is the very important to understand. This, there are no rules how to do this project and to discover and to failure. And of course, we have a failure sometimes. We don't hire the right people. We spend a lot of money for something completely wrong. We go back again and try to correct it. It's very adventure in life. You cannot imagine that. And I love it so much. Okay, the lady, the, okay, the lady Hi, who's good evening. desperately <laughs> tried to ask me. Um, I would like to ask you uh, why, what fascinates you about the oil barrel and why you pick up red and blue as colors and also what um, material are you thinking about using in the future? Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> you see very well that uh, the barrels is not material. Barrels is something together with many other things. The landscape, the space, and everything is not the barrels himself don't mean anything. But the barrel story of the barrels and very articulate and exhibition start from many humble moments of my life, very early stage when I was living in in Paris, arriving in 1958, and I was living in uh, maids' rooms, the top floor, no elevator, and I have two maids' rooms to do my work, one room. With maids room, I do my packages. Another maids room, I do the small cans. Start with little cans, you know, who was wrapped and non-wrapped. Tin cans, small size barrels, and after these barrels, very simply classical sculpture. There was the, you see them very well in the exhibition of uh, Serpentine Gallery, and from that uh, element, who was the home site, home sites sculpture, we extended to that large open space. In 1961, and the uh, exhibition in Cologne, very fast, and from there going ahead. But basically, the barrels is not the barrels himself. You know very well that Rubens County in Paris is not the barrels. There was the barrels blocking a street. There was the buildings. There was a street. Many other things. And the barrels did not exist like the barrels themselves. They, they are part of the landscape of the structure, and the problem from the the story from the very small master bar to the larger size master bar to the size that we like to do form who is not invented by me. Is many parts you see in the master bar project is that this angle of 60 degree is not invented. You stack cylindrical object is always 60 degree. Only this invented me is the proportions two, three, four. The proportion two, three, four, who is exactly the proportion of the master bar of Serpent Lake, with the proportion also of the Abu Dhabi Mastaba, who is actually 50 times bigger, he created that absolutely different perception of the scale of the work and the surface and the mass of proportion of the site. The, all the pyramid and all the trapezoid have the four slanted slides. This is totally different. When you're in the middle of the sloping side, 60 degree, you do not see left and right the vertical side. You have this incredible invitation, stairway, going 550 meter high to these uh, uh, barrels. In the same way, on the vertical side, you have these barrels who is not like a brick wall. They are like an uh, offset, as you can see very well, coming from the ring of the barrels. This is very simple things. Created that enormous commanding dimension. And when you move around the sculpture, the, uh, the, the structure, you can see very well that when, in like the pyramid, they are all slanted. When you little, you see a little part of the vertical wall, entire structure exploding. 
the two, the uh, slanted wall move everything out. It's moving like that, everything bigger like that. All that is part who is exceptional in that uh, form, who is the mastaba and that proportion. All that come with the, also with the side. This is why the sculpture is not something like that. It's related to the side. We like to do the project in contrast with the, that powerful geometry in the sides of four kilometers area of that sand landscape in the dunes. The question also included the colors, and it's interesting because you asked yeah. about the color, uh, red, you know, the colors, and um, from the very beginning you said you wouldn't use yellow in yeah. the park. Can you no, tell no. us about the choice? Because I think no. that's your second part, no, the, right? the pre, three primary, the, the three is the red, blue, and yellow. And of course, we like to have a structure, you know, is extremely painterly structure, but um, very, very variation of color. And actually, there are only three colors, red, blue, and mauve, and another red with white. The vertical red, blue, mauve, it created that almost incredible presence in the, all the greenery in the park, because there's no yellow. And the yellow make that. The, right, the, the structure is like a projecting and forcefully to the, all the vegetation come out of something so unusual because you have these only two primary colors, red and blue. And all that you see very well, like going through all the sides. So the same way that the vertical wall is, uh, and the shadow is very monos menacing, dark, and only in the moment is lit, it became totally different. All that is also very part of the, how the project is designed. Also orientation with the sunrise, sunrise sundown, all that angle is all part of the, uh, the work, work in the lake. Do you want to take one or two more questions? Yes, or? I can take questions. I'm not sorry. Yeah, question, okay. Uh, I, I, the are... gentleman there, I remember, he asked us there in the corner. I come, the lady. Hi. Uh, yes, you mentioned the, uh, in the exhibition the small cans, the wrapped and the unwrapped cans. I was just really interested in those as, from a small scale. I, why did you have the wrapped and unwrapped? And also, would you do something small again? I do always small pieces, you know. <laughs> I do little drawings and sketches all the time. You know, it is, uh, I, I love to work with my hands, my finger. I continue to do small pieces. It's not true that I don't do small pieces. Uh, even, uh, even sometimes small objects, but rarely now. But I do many small pieces because I like to work with my finger. And drawings, I totally, I have no assistant, you know. You should know everything in that exhibition is done by my own, my own hands. No, anybody touch anything. Everything is done by my own hands. And all that is really because I enjoy it with my finger to touch things. And it's part of my, all the time I do, uh, sometimes do small pieces, sometimes scale models, smaller size, some things, all the time. Of course, there are more smaller pieces in early years that I have more time to do with my finger. Something. Yeah. We couldn't hear you. So I was just interested in why you originally did the wrapping on, on the I found the wrapping, okay. Yeah, the, the very first time, the the first time you okay. did that. Okay, I could do the wrapping, okay. Of course, some project they wrapped, like a wrap course in Australia, the rice stack, running fence was not wrapped, umbrellas was not wrapped, they're not. But the, we used the cloth, probably the cloth was the principal material to translate the nomadic character of the project. The project, they have many other materials, but they install very fast, like a nomadic tribe can build their city, their tents overnight, and they're gone after that. That dynamic is translated by the cloth, like a second skin of the project who is installed simultaneously very fast. And of course, this is the, all this temporary project, the cloth live in that dimension. Sometimes it's really wrapping, sometimes it's part of the structure, like the running fence of Valley Curtain. But it's told, actually, Valley Curtain was open in a matter of less than 15 minutes. And suddenly, only was the cable, suddenly we have the block orange fabric. And the cloth is the element. But some wrap project is really the wrap, like the pond, the like rice stack. And the cloth was older, like history, and history of art, like a history of art. For 1,000 art years, artists do the cloth, not a real cloth. They make painting of the cloth. They make sculpture where the cloth even translates 
the style of the sculpture. Like a medieval sculpture, the cloth is more angular, and the Baroque sculpture, the fabric go all direction. The best example of what the cloth do in classical art is not invented by me, is the story of Rodin. Rodin took two versions of the figure of Balzac. The first version, Balzac was totally neck, naked, belly, big belly, skinny legs, and many details. What Rodin did, we take the cape of Balzac, put it, put it in liquid plaster, and shroud the figure of Balzac we have on Boulevard Traspai, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Basically, he hides all the details on the body of Balzac to highlight principal proportion of the figure of Balzac. With our wrapping project, we do exactly the same thing. The rice that we don't wrap, wrap rice that like that. We prepare so many still elements to cascade the fabric over the rice stack. Where the rice stack was wrapped, you clearly see the geometry, the fronton, and the tower, everything. The rice stack like architecture was much readable when it was wrapped because there was no window, there was no sculpture, there was no ornament, all that. But in like the classical sculpture, all this still picture, they are full motion. They move with the wind. They move with everything. For example, when we wrap the rust that we, we was not wrapped with scaffolding, we have a rock climbers literally come down with the fabric wrapping the rust. We build see-through running fans that people of Berlin can see the actual wrapping. We remove the wrapping, uh, the fence, and the people was walking around the rice stack and coming and touching the rice stack fabric, pushing, touching. You don't see any people in London touching the buildings. <laughs> and that is the whole story of this project. Nobody touching the buildings. Uh, but this is why they are very essential things. There are many, many things involving all this project that need to be experienced to see what they do. It was also fascinating this morning, Christo, because you said this morning that already in 61, you and Jean-Claude had this epiphany to wrap a building, yeah. but it took you actually many years until then yeah. in 68, yeah. I think. Yeah. Harald Seemann, uh, the Kunsthalle Bern was the first, the 50th anniversary yeah. became the first wrap yeah. building. So. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, there was the, we tried to do the wrap a parliament already in 1961, or prison, the really public building. Prison or parliament was impossible. <laughs> Finally, we wrap a parliament. <laughs> Now, other question. <laughs> We've got a question from Matt Copson. Where is Matt Copson? I, I, I see somebody. We're ignoring. There are many here, ladies. Okay, madam. Wait, wait, wait. I don't see. Ah, here, here, Hi. madam. Hello, Christo. I have a question, which are both maybe related. So, what are your obsessions, and how is the best way that you describe your personality? <laughs> I do not know. <laughs> I do not know, madame. I, I have no time to think about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, the same, madame. You started by giving a very astute uh, advice to young artists, but what drew you to art to begin with? Why were you interested in art to begin with? Why did you go why, and why yeah, became why, artist? Why did you become an artist? Ah, okay, that is the like everybody. I give that to my mother and my father. <laughs> I tell you, uh, I was very young. My mother saw that I was drawing nonstop, and she decided I should have a private lesson of art instead to have private lesson on piano or other musical instrument. After school, I go to the real painter who real painting to real sculpture, real sculpture wire, to real architect that cut the make scale model. I was six, seven years old, eight years old. And since that age, I tried to be an artist. <laughs> Never think to do anything else. I enjoyed tremendously. I enjoyed, like, a, when you play a musical instrument, probably enjoy so much that you enjoy to do all things with your finger. This is the whole story. We can take one or two last questions. Yeah, we have somebody okay, waiting madame. here okay. for a long time. Yeah. Welcome, madame. Yes. How much do you imagine compared to how much do you make? I say that we have 47 projects not realized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, some projects we abandoned because we don't like to do it anymore. 
with some project, uh, we like uh, Reichstag was refused, but we tried to do it. You know, the project have their, is in, there are no rules how some projects stay in our heart and our mind. There is some projects stay even that they were refused three times, like the Reichstag or the Gates was refused. They stay in so many circumstances and our heart, some project. Well, I can give a very funny story. <laughs> very funny story because it's always funny. In 1975, we tried to wrap the tallest monument of Christophe Columbus and Barcelona. We love Spain. And we make scale models, we make drawings and sketches. And after two, uh, two years of negotiation, the mayor of Barcelona say no, and he was assassinated. <laughs> Not by us. <laughs> in the early 80s, we start again with another mayor, and he also say no. He was always put out, coup d'etat, but he survived. <laughs> and 19, uh, but the project was still making. And in 1984, we received telegram from the mayor of Barcelona, Pascual de Maragai, who brought the Olympic Games in Barcelona, Christo Jean-Claude, come, I'll give you all the permission to wrap Cristobal Colombs in Barcelona. Jean-Claude and myself, we don't like to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you understand? If we don't like to do it anymore, why we should do it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.